I told my publishers I would be shameless and hold up my new book in case anyone in the room is interested and susceptible to being led around by an author holding his book up in front of a, <laughs> front of a room. That's a definition of literacy we might want to get into later. But this book does deal in some depth with participatory culture, learning, politics. It's a collection of interviews from my blog with a number of the figures that I will be citing in the talk that follows, including James Paul G, Mimi Ito, Craig Watkins, and others who are important thinkers on literacy and extends into politics. So I'm going to talk, I told John I couldn't really speak to games. I've done game studies off and on over that period of time, but I have not done any game studies in the last 10 years. So I'm going to focus my discussion around literacy and fandom, using fandom as an example of what John just called self-organizing groups that are trying to promote various kinds of literacy. And you get a sense of fandom as a site of literacy in this opening slide. Were you disappointed by a TV series, book, or film? If you still love your fandom, discover fan fiction today and have the story your way. So the sense of active rewriting and retelling of stories is a central driving force of fandom and has been, as I'm going to suggest in this talk, for more than 100 years. So I'm going to look at the ways fandom fosters literacies as well as tensions within fandom over the definition of literacy. And I'm taking as my starting point the, the recognition that Archive of Our Own received at the Hugo Awards this August. And I'll di break that down for you. Why is this a significant thing? What is Archive of Our Own? What is the Hugo Awards? And so forth. But I want to begin with this quote from Naomi Novik, who was uh, accepting the award. She says, all fan work, from fanfic <coughs> to vids to fan art to podfic, centers the idea that art happens not in isolation, but in community. All our hard work and contributions would mean nothing without the work of the fan creators who share their work freely with other fans and the fans who read their stories and view their art and comment and share bookmarks and give kudos to encourage them and nourish, nourish the community in their turn. So th this award is giving it the Worldcon in Dublin in 2019. There are 8,748 attendees representing 64 countries. Uh, it's a mixture of fans and professionals representing the industries that have grown up around fantasy, science fiction, horror, comics, and other forms of speculative fiction. Uh, the Hugo Award that this past year went to, among other things, the novel The Calculating Stars, the animated film Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, the episode Janet from the television show The Good Place. So if you look at the list of Hugos, it looks mostly like a list of outstanding genre fiction across popular media. Uh, Archive of Our Own, uh, known as AO3 for short, is an online platform for fan works, creative work based on existing media like novels, films, comics, television, series, video games produced by the fans of the original. The last data point I found on it said there were more than 5 million works archived, representing almost 2 million registered users. So I've, the old days when I talked about fanfic, there was a sense of, people kept wanting to ask me how much there was, and with a sense that if I told you, it would seem minuscule. In fact, these numbers are pretty damn impressive. I consider Archive of Our Own to be one of the landmark accomplishments of participatory culture in the network era alongside Wikipedia. I think I'd put them more or less uh, on, a, on a plateau as accomplishments that demonstrate what happens when self-organizing groups engage in arcs of literacy. So the works represent more than 30,000 fandoms around the world. The Marvel Universe has 340,375 works as of this data point. Final Fantasy, 37,000. New Kids on the Block, 197 works down to the board game Candyland, which has five works, mm -hmm. right? There's, but there's an extraordinary range of media that's being represented. So what's interesting about AO3 and the ways it breaks the mold? You have a room full of people who represent traditional publishing and the pipeline into it, giving an award to a group that operates outside the publishing world or academia almost altogether. That, uh, that is authorship is collective rather than individual, and we'll drill down to what I mean by that, but 
the rest of the people in the room are largely focused on self public on works that they create themselves that they're autonomous authors over and artworks are appropriative and transformative rather than original and that word original gets thrown around a lot in debates within the fan community between several different populations with different histories. And the notion that fan fiction is not original is often used as a weapon against it. But in fact, the fan community itself has embraced this term transformative to discuss the ways they work on raw materials drawn from the culture around them and transform them into something that has greater relevance for their community. Now, as we think about the Hugo Award, we need to think about the figure of Hugo Gernsback. Hugo Gernsback is often called the father of modern American science fiction. He's an amateur, he's an inventor. He created the walkie-talkie. Uh, he's a leader in the amateur radio movement at a time when radio is pushing against forces of commercialization and centralization. He publishes popular science magazines. He's very dedicated to the idea of popular education in the sciences or popular science literacy, the capacity to understand the complex changes he saw shaping the 20th century and the needs to make those more accessible outside of the scientific and technological elites. So he begins to publish stories called science fiction or later science fiction in his magazine, which are intended to be prods for communities of people to come together and debate the nature of science, the fact, blurring of lines between fact and fantasy, the, the speculation beyond known science, but within rules that scientists might recognize. Um, Michael Saylor in a book called As If calls this a public sphere of the imagination. The idea that fans who gather around fictional works in the late 19th, early 20th century would engage in heated debates about the rules and perimeters of those worlds, much as people like Michael Warner, who talks about the public sphere, talk about other kinds of politic publications generating publics around them in which ideas are debated and discussed. And we could take that back to Habermas's coffee shops, where, which were sprinkled with publications and periodicals intended to prod people to discuss. So the fandom was understood by Gernsback as a public sphere of sorts, of space where ideas are debated and discussed, and it's understood as a tool for scientific literacy. When he begins to publish his letters to the editor in his magazines and publishes the address, these young people, mostly teenagers in Cleveland and Brooklyn, across America, begin to write each other, begin to form a virtual network, uh, a network of people of shared passions and interests who don't necessarily live in the same geographic area. And they do so on the back of the infrastructure provided by the Amateur Press Association, which traces its history back to the mid-19th century. In the mid-19th century, teenagers began using toy printing presses to create their own publications, which were circulating nationally and became the center of debate, and even debating things like uh, white supremacy, succession, women's rights, and so forth, in very heated ways in these publications that predate the Civil War. As they're setting toy type, it becomes really difficult to set all the types, so they begin a system of abbreviations, a kind of shared slang which allow them to abbreviate certain messages. One piece of that slang was LOL. So the phrase we now associate with digital communities, literally we could trace a straight line back to these amateur press publications, and the young science fiction fans began using the infrastructure on practices of that community to produce their own science fiction scenes. Now, their aspirations was to break into the biz. They wanted to be the next generation of writers for Hugo Gernsback and John Campbell's magazines. They wanted to become, and in fact, they did become almost every major writer, editor, artist who worked in science fiction came up through fandom. There was a pipeline established where professionals helped these young men acquire the skills necessary to bootstrap them into writing within the terms of the industry. And I say young men because it was overwhelmingly a young men's society. There were some women who made it in, who proved they could be some of the guys, but it's really in the 1960s that women began coming into the ranks of the science fiction fandom in great numbers, uh, mostly in response to the overtly feminist writings that are coming out in the early 1960s in science fiction fandom, and they began insisting on doing their own writing, 
and they are both blocked by the Good Boys Network from gaining professional publication in many cases, and they're sexually harassed, ridiculed by the men attending the science fiction convention, which by 1967-68, they break off and form a fandom of their own, and that fandom becomes Star Trek fandom. So Star Trek fandom is coming in at the time women are becoming centrally involved in fandom. The overall majority of people who organized the Star Trek fandom were women. Uh, they were seeking a, play, a space to publish their own stuff. Those women are being ridiculed by the men in the science fiction fan world as truckies, meaning groupies. And they insisted, we're not truckies, we're truckers, we're active participants in constructing the world of Star Trek. And they insisted on their rights to have participatory authorship rather than simply seeing their work, seeing their work in subcultural terms, rather than seeing their work as a pipeline into the industry. And we began to see the emergence of these magazines, fanzines, that then spread to other television and film programs that began to diversify, and Star Trek fandom becomes media fandom. As the internet comes in, these women are early adapters of the internet, and they're training each other how to use the technology at a point where many people are still speculating that the internet's rooted in major research institutions, technical universities, military bases is going to be overwhelmingly men. Fan women are among those who were the first to really break into that space and carve out a space for female authorship through digital media. We flip forward to about a decade ago. Suddenly in the era of Web 2.0, industry starts to discover that these women are publishing fan fiction in record numbers. We want to figure out how to, to commercialize it, come forward with a typical Web 2.0 schema. This one, the first two are part of an actual ad for a group called Fan Lib. The third is a fan response. These organi this organization made all the classic Web 2.0 mistakes, including not having any women on the board of directors for an organization appealing overwhelmingly to female participants. The women stood up and said, we're not going to be commercialized in this way. We want to own the servers. And so they collectively pooled money, bought servers, created an organization where coders coded, lawyers defended them, academics wrote rationale and agreed to be expert witnesses. They built a system designed to be a support and defense mechanism for fan fiction in these women's publications. And the result is the Organization for Transformative Works. Among other things, it created an academic journal called Transformative Works and Cultures, which is one of the best sites for fan study, fandom studies today and has an incredible peer review system that's really helping academic writers pipeline their way into the industry. It's become the central so focus of battles over copyright and defense of fans, and it's become an incredible network uh, where fans are able to publish their work and has begun to do the hard work of creating this in multiple languages so that it bridges from the United States to the rest of the world. So the male fans had a world con when it was just Brooklyn and Cleveland. These women are really taking the steps necessary to really globalize the publication of fan fiction. And as this is taking place, the, traditionally, women, if they made it into the industry, were told to strip all signs of their earlier reputation as fan fiction writers. Instead, when Twilight, when uh, Fifty Shades of Grey came out, the author outed herself as having written it originally as Twilight fan fiction. It broke the barrier, and we're starting to see more and more interest in the publishing world in these women who come up through fan fiction, and you start to see commercial sites designed to attract that. So Francesca Kappa, who was, the char who was the president of the Organization for Transformative Works, reports that there's been a shift from industries going after fans for copyright violation to industries trying to co-opt, uh, appropriate, uh, commercialized fan fiction as a gateway into commercial success. And so the, the organization has weathered both of those storms. Now, as we look at what the organization does well, it creates a space for support for writers through what's known as beta reading primarily. But it's really people publish works in progress. They get feedback on it. Uh, they continue to grow and expand. They build on each other's stories. All of this is counted in Hellickson and Boussier's classic fan fiction and fan communities, the age of the internet. In terms of early prototypes of this, it's now on mega speed with the, trans with the archive of our own. 
This is very much what I described in a white paper I wrote from the MacArthur Foundation as the social production of meaning, as more than individual interpretation multiplied. It's a qualitative difference in the ways we make sense of cultural experience, represents a profound change in how we understand literacy. In such a world, youth need skills for working within social networks, for pooling knowledge within a collective intelligence, for negotiating across cultural differences that shape the governing assumptions in different communities, and for reconciling conflicting bits of data to form a coherent picture of the world around them. There's a new book out, Writers in the Secret Garden, which looks at this in terms of the concept of distributed mentorship, arguing that the fact that there is an abundance of stories, that these stories build up over time, that there's a support system that's committed to those stories that is always readily available, that is not dependent on geographic location or temporal synchronicity, that's allowing people to give each other feedback without regard to status or hierarchy, and how driven by AFAC, driven by the emotional connection, that they have these characters, these stories, which give common ground among people. So it really describes fan fiction writing and fan publishing as this ideal model of distributed mentorship that other organizations should be studying as they think about it. And it's the latest in a whole two decades worth of work and among educational researchers looking at the mechanisms of fan fiction and the ways in which they're fostering literacy. Um, so this book by Rebecca Black talks about anime fan fiction and the ways in which writers in the United States and elsewhere who want to understand Japanese culture and language better can find connection with Japanese writers who want to practice their English. And both sides learn from each other to create a different kind of understanding at the intersex between, intersection between East and West. Now, as I talk about it, I want to take a moment to think about appropriation. Because this is a term I've used loosely throughout my career. It's now becoming increasingly politically laden term. I follow Bakhtin in believing that we don't take our words pristine from the dictionary. We take them from other people's mouths dripping with saliva, right? That the words come with histories of use, that all writing involves building on a cultural reservoir. So appropriation per se in my account is not bad. Appropriation that is, take, it takes, exploits people, marginalizes people, alienates people, removes people from a conversation about their own culture, this is where the problem lies. And I would hope that our field could gradually develop a more nuanced vocabulary for thinking about the difference between the kind of appropriation of culture that all culture depends on and the kind, particular forms of cultural appropriation which are deeply destructive to communities or disempowerment. And that means bringing in ethics of appropriation, notions of power into the conversation of appropriation, but not getting rid of the concept of appropriation altogether because to me, appropriation is fundamental to the notion of literacy. So I write about a lot of this in Reading and Participatory Culture, which is the work we did with um, Ricardo Pizzuoli, an African-American playwright and theater director in Rhode Island, who was going into the prisons and working with incarcerated youth, mostly youth of color, to get them to read Moby Dick which is an incredibly ambitious, difficult novel. Very few Americans read it anymore. And he had them do it by having them rewrite Moby Dick to think about what the story might mean in a 21st century context, where it becomes, a, in their hands, a story about gangs, about a gang leader who was disregarding the business of dealing drugs in favor of trying to seek vengeance for harms done to him and his family by the great white thing, which is the cocaine cartel. And so it's about how far does a gang follow its leader into the path of destruction in the ways in which they read the story. And it was very much an appropriation and a retelling of Moby Dick that opened up these young people to kinds of literacy that were closed to them. And far from seeing Moby Dick as a work of a dead white author, white author as some people might see it, Ricardo said that everyone's in the, on the boat in Moby Dick, that it was already a story of multiculturalism and it's about reclaiming those identities and reshaping the stereotypes Melville built on in order to create a different kind of work and a different kind of story. More generally, what we see is as fans go online, they become inculcated into the values of fandom. When the internet 
first came about, there was a sense that the traditional values of the fan culture would be scattered and lost as so many people were coming in that couldn't be assimilated into the community. These fan fiction sites become a place of passing along community lore, including the reproduction of certain genres or readings, ways of looking at images, a kind of media literacy uh, that allows us to read images in certain ways, looks, gestures, contacts between men in particular, we emerge as Slash, which is originally Kirk's Spock. I put in this picture from uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe because uh, partially as a joke for Tencent because this was a poster that was outside a movie theater in China. That the Chinese pirating a version of the film to show in their theater also pirated a poster off the internet and instead picked anatomy literacy themselves picked up a piece of slash art, fan art and used it as the poster for the film. And this became a kind of international incident. So I, I like this kind of cross-cultural miscommunication here. Uh, Kim Bannister, who's a fan fiction writer, uh, describes fan fiction in this way. What I love about fandom is the freedom we've allowed ourselves to create and recreate our characters over and over again. Fan fiction rarely sits still. It's like a living, evolving thing, taking on its own life, one story building another, each writer's reality bouncing off another's and maybe even melding together to form a whole new creation. We've given ourselves license to do whatever we want and it's very liberating. And I like the self-determination in this quote, right? That fandom is something we have allowed ourselves. It is something we have given ourselves license to do, not something that is top-down regulated or instructed through schools. It's a kind of literacy that is grassroots and deeply collaborative at its core. And the models of collaboration are very clear at the surface in this quote. So, a lot of the news coverage these days about fandom emphasizes kind of toxic white masculine fan practices, angry white guys upset about white, white uh, black stormtroopers and female ghostbusters, right? That that's the story that's being covered and that's the story the media wants to represent. But I would argue something more is going on in fandom around race at the current moment. The heated debates about it, there's a lot of pain and agony caused by some of those debates on all sides, but at the same time, I see the core of fandom moving toward support for more inclusive representations and modeling through thousands, if not millions of stories, what that might look like. How do we rewrite the genres of the 19th century into something that will tell new stories about race? And in that sense, fandom functions as an innovation commons, a place where many people are writing stories and debates are held around them, out of which will come new models for fiction. We've already seen the model of fan fiction shape constructions of masculinity on television. I would say the modern bromance, as it's called, in the television industry really is an outgrowth of industry beginning to recognize the way fan women have read and discussed stories through the years. Fandom, in turn, is a space where art multimodality is being taught. And it's not just these fans are taking televisual text and turning it into literary text, Work, but they're also working with artists who may illustrate that work. They may edit vids that reflect those interpretations. They may redo cosplay that builds off of fan fiction in a variety of ways. So there's a whole range of skills of processing media that go beyond simply the reading and writing practice that we're already sort of clear from what I've said into something that is more multimodal and takes on what people are calling 21st century skills. My latest work has been very much about civic imagination and fan activism in one way or another. So this is a book that comes out in March, Popular Culture and the Civic Imagination. What we're arguing is that the civic imagination is fundamental to maintaining civic relationships in a harshly politicized era. And it, has those relate, and it does so in a number of ways. First of all, before you can build a better world, you need to know what a better world looks like. You have to imagine yourself as an agent capable of making change. You have to feel yourself a member of an imagining community. I see the play on Benedict Anderson's imaginative community. I think it's got to be more active than inheriting someone else's imagination for your community. You have to imagine a model for change. You have to sympathize, empathize, feel solidarity, choose your word with people whose experiences are different from your own. And for the most oppressed group in any society, you have to imagine equality, freedom, dignity, 
before you, have, before you actually experience it. And those are the things that fuel political change. So what we're seeing around the globe is the use of pop culture iconography and references in political activism and various forms of fan-based activism which are mobilizing the large communities that organize online as agents for democratic change. And we see the three-finger salute from uh, Hunger Games being used in Thailand by student protesters and by the umbrella movement in China as part of the ways that people engage with political struggles. At the same time, we're seeing these female coders develop new models of how you manage massive amount of material, how you tag it in such a way that people can find what they're looking for, and contain voluntary warnings on things like weight rape, incest, sexual violence, which allow people to feel a sense of protection, security, safety as they engage with stories that someone else might need to tell, but that they don't need to read. And so those exchanges, I think, are people are now studying the tagging system on Archive of Our Own to understand how this operates uh, and how to change it. Now, as we look at all of this, we need to be, you know, we're, what uh, over 20 years of research of educators has started to filter into educational policy in the United States. I'm part of the MacArthur Foundation. It's originally called the Digital Media and Learning Initiative, now called the Connected Learning Initiative. My colleague. Mimi Ito, who was a fan of, Jap studied Japanese otaku culture and fan vidding culture. I studied fandom. James Paul G. studied games. We were all foundational in thinking through what it would mean to look at informal learning outside of schools, how literacy takes place in those settings, and to begin to redesign libraries, after school programs, and schools to reflect some of the things we learned there. Uh, so the U Media Center at the Chicago Public Library is based on Mimi's work, where it's looking at young people hanging out, messing around, and geeking out with digital media. It's built in the architecture and support structure there. It's a model that's been replicated at more than 100 libraries across the US at this point. We recognize from the beginning that what formal education will not change rapidly enough to reflect the kind of informal learning that we're talking about here. Uh, the for, as this quote says, formal education is often conservative, informing is off, informal is often experimental, formal is static, informal is innovative, the structures are sane, informal learning are more provisional, those supporting formal education are more institutionalized. You can read the rest, but there are lots of obstacles or problems as we think about this. If, because this is passion-driven writing, because it comes out of shared values as a community, you can't just plop the practices in the classroom and expect them to work. There is some moments of recognition if you bring some of them in. We did some of this work with our Moby Dick project. But ultimately, you want to support and sustain these informal, grassroots, self-organizing modes of teaching literacy if you want to really foster the literacies that matter in the 21st century. And I sort of point here to. James Paul G's notion of the affinity space, which really is probably known to some of you who study gaming. G is very clear in his definition that it's about shared resources, but not necessarily a notion of community. So it's a space where people pool the resources together they need to sustain each other's activity, but it doesn't require, as fandom and participatory culture does, a sense of strong community ties, community mechanisms, <coughs> infrastructures that draw on participation. And so G and I are allies, but we arrive at a slightly different model for thinking about what's going on, in part because I study fandom and he studies games. And the communities have different social dynamics that we have to factor in when you look at what literacy means in those spaces. And I want to point out this new book by uh, Craig Watkins, which is really looking at the inequalities that operate in these kinds of participatory cultures. He's looking at Latinx youth, black youth in Texas the ways that they are not necessarily encouraged to participate, the ways in which they're blocked or marginalized. And I see this as part of a larger conversation with writers like Rukmindi Pandey, who are thinking about racial and marginalization within fandom that we all need to take on and really own and explore. At this point, I'm sort of advocating decolonizing some of the work that I helped create in the field of fandom studies, but I think it's the step that has to happen next. So with that, I'm going to end by rereading uh, the quote that I began with, because I think it will mean something more to you if we look at it now. That all fan work, from fanfic to vids, to fan art, to poetic, 
centers, or pod, uh, poetic centers the idea that art happens not in isolation, but in community. All of our hard work and contributions would mean nothing without the work of the fan creators who share their work freely with other fans and the fans who read their stories and view their artwork and comment and shared, share bookmarks and give kudos to encourage them and nourish the community in their turn. So there we see all of that activity of a community sustaining popular literacy, open literacy in the terms of the conference and the kind of collaborative work necessary for literacy to be a social skill rather than an individualized skill in a network society. So with that, I uh, will close my talk. <laughs>